In any other age, Leon de Grel would have been a hero. He was handsome, charismatic, ambitious. La victoire de Rex est certaine. Demain ou après. A decorated soldier and a leader of men. Et moi, je connais quelque chose, sûrement. Non, je ne connais qu'un homme politique qui s'est engagé pour combattre lui-même sur le front. Je n'en connais aucun autre. But unfortunately, Leon de Grel was also a Belgian fascist. And he fell in love with Nazi Germany. Gerard is seven man hofar. Brach sich on zwei Grundsätze For years, he courted the Nazis. And for years, they rejected him. But eventually, Hitler welcomed him into his embrace, but at a terrible price. For to be accepted by the Nazis, de Grel would have to betray everything he stood for. He would betray his faith, his country, and become a collaborator. He was prepared to sacrifice those who followed him and see Belgium eradicated entirely. Leon de Grel was born in 1906 here in Bouillon, a small town in the heart of Belgium's Ardennes. His father ran a successful brewery business, and in the 1920s, he underwent a strict Jesuit education. He later won a place to the Catholic University at Louvain, near Brussels, to study law. Very soon, his life would be shaped by two factors, his pure ambition and his search for a cause. At first, it was the Catholic faith that attracted him. The young religious activist wanted to write about the church. So he became a journalist for Les Cahiers de la Jeunesse Catholique, and in 1930 became manager of Christus Rex, a religious publishing house. De Grel seemed to have found his calling. He abandoned his law degree and set about building Christus Rex into a movement to agitate for religious and social reform. And there was plenty to agitate about. The Great Depression of the 1930s hit Europe hard. Belgium was no exception. Poverty, discontent, and social unrest spread across the continent. Far-left movements like communism were on the rise. A succession of short-lived coalitions failed to provide Belgium with stability and strong leadership. De Grel thought the source of all these problems was a lack of religious faith and a decline in morals. There was a bigger problem too. Belgium's national identity was in crisis, and the country risked being torn apart. It was fragmented between the French-speaking Walloons and Dutch-speaking Flemish. The Flemish wanted to split the country and become part of Holland. There was bitter rivalry between both factions. De Grel believed only a powerful patriotic government could counter Flemish nationalism. So he decided to do something about it and started one of the strangest sagas in Belgian politics. De Grel turned his movement into a political force called Rexism. His goal was to build Rexism into a fully fledged political movement. Nous passons à travers tous les obstacles. Pacifiquement, 
nous sauverons notre pays, nous y rendrons l'unité, l'âme et le bonheur. Rex vaincra. One woman who remembers the excitement generated by Rexism is Marie Josée de Goy, whose father was a supporter. Mon père allait déjà aux réunions, mais j'entendais ce qu'il disait. Il disait que c'était chouette, que c'était un jeune qui enfin allait un petit peu bousculer la politique actuelle. Pour lui, c'était un chef. De Grel used the Christus Rex machine to promote his message of social and religious reform via its newspaper, Le Pays Réel. The young leader hit the campaign trail to argue the case for stronger governance and a unified Belgium. He called for a Belgian new order. La victoire de Rex est certaine, demain ou après. De Grel was undoubtedly a fine public speaker. People started to pay attention, especially traditional Catholic voters in search of a new choice. Je dois dire qu'il a d'abord été un tribun qui a attiré les foules, c'est pas, pas croyable. Beaucoup, beaucoup de gens chrétiens et croyants, parce qu'au fond, il n'y avait que la gauche et la droite. Hein. Tout le monde était pour, euh, pour sauvegarder la, la morale chrétienne, je dirais. In the run-up to the general elections of 1936, his Rexists took part in demonstrations. And de Grel's own profile as a provocateur soared. Police and communist interrupters come to grips with the Rexists and general rioting breaks out. De Grel is arrested. Monsieur de Grel, indicated by Addo, claims that the Rex party numbers half a million and will be in power in a few months. He and 800 followers are bundled up to the police station. De Grel has since said he will continue his bid for power. The elections brought the Rexists success. Donc, je vous dis, il y a eu un engouement comme une renaissance, mais fou. Moi, je n'entendais que par les Rex et même les amis de papa. Ils étaient beaucoup étaient enthousiastes. D'ailleurs, dans toutes les communes, il a eu tellement de beaux résultats que dans toutes les communes, il y a eu des bourgmestres rexistes. Though de Grel didn't run for parliament himself, aged just 30, he had become a rising political star. As leader of a dynamic new force in parliament, his raw ambition was paying off. Quelques mois ont suffi pour que des centaines de milliers d'hommes fussent avec nous, fraternels, dans un don total. Le 24 mai 1936, 300 000 électeurs portaient aux chambres en un seul coup 33 parlementaires rexistes. But de Grel's Rex Party was viewed by some to be an extremist movement, and increasingly his activists took on the air of Catholic fascists. To promote his particular brand of politics, de Grel needed his own political platform. So he decided to become a member of parliament. He forced a Rexist politician to resign and triggered a by-election. De Grel would fight for the parliamentary seat in Brussels in March 1937. The government, alarmed by the rise of extremism, had already tried to ban his Rex party from the radio. Now, they seized their chance to humiliate him. The Catholic Prime Minister, Paul Van Zeeland, stood against him. He hit at de Grel's claim to speak for disenchanted Catholic voters. Then Cardinal Van Roy, the leader of the Belgian Catholic Church, pronounced that Rexism was a menace. It was a disaster for de Grel. He was defeated. 
Labelled an extremist by voters and parties alike and disowned by the Catholic Church, de Grel was in the political wilderness, his career over. The Rexists lost public support and membership dwindled. To make things worse, as the threat of war with Germany loomed, de Grel was arrested and imprisoned as a dangerous Nazi sympathizer. He was shipped off to a jail in France. The charismatic hero had become the loser. Then came the war. May 1940, Hitler's armies launched their blitzkrieg attack on France. On the way, panzers sliced through Holland and Belgium. They destroyed everything in their path. The small Belgian army and her allies were powerless. Belgium was defeated in just 18 days. For the second time in a quarter of a century, the country had to endure occupation by Germany. Belgium's King Leopold III signed the document of surrender. This created a power vacuum in the country's politics. Leading politicians struggled to deal with occupation and vied for power and influence with the Nazis. This should have been de Grel's moment to step in and claim a stake in the new political landscape. There was just one problem. At the time, many thought he was dead, shot by the French in captivity. When news of Germany's invasion reached him in jail, he realized that if he was ever to create his vision of a new order, he had to get out of prison. because back in Belgium, events were moving against him. The Germans imposed their own military administration under Egert Rieder. Rieder then employed a classic divide and rule tactic. He decided to play the Dutch-speaking Flemish off against the French-speaking Walloons by recruiting key administrators from a Flemish nationalist party, the fascist VNV. The VNV were rivals to de Grel's Rexists, and his party was out in the cold. So when de Grel was released from prison three months later, in July 1940, he found himself rejected, with no power and no influence. But instead of turning against the Nazis, he resolved to make himself indispensable and prove he could be their man to lead Belgium. So he petitioned the Germans. He met the collaborationist Prime Minister of France, Pierre Laval. He courted everyone from the king to his old critic, Cardinal Van Roy. But it didn't work. Under the direct orders of Hitler's propaganda chief, Joseph Goebbels, de Grel was ignored. Frustrated and rejected again, the outsider decided it was time to try something new. As the sincerest form of flattery is imitation, that was what he did. De Grel remodeled Rexism along purely fascist lines, the mirror image of the Nazis. The Nazis had a swastika. He commissioned a new heraldic flag. 
Hitler had his own uniformed thugs, the brown-shirted SA. So de Grel created Les Formations de Combat, his very own political enforcers. The Nazis rewrote German history and created their own cult-like ideology, where everyone swore allegiance to a great leader. De Grel did the same, making himself the Belgian Führer figure. And whereas the Nazis had the Hitler Youth, de Grel created his own youth movements to encourage youngsters to join the party. Many children of Rexists found themselves enrolled. Moi j'avais 15 ans. Et c'est alors que mon papa a dit, comme nous étions trois filles, je vais vous mettre à la jeunesse parce que nous n'irons plus à la mer, peut-être pour plusieurs années. Et vous mettre dans un mouvement de jeunesse, ça vous fera du bien. Vous allez rencontrer des jeunes et, et comme ça, ça c'est bien, c'est une jolie distraction pour l'été. Je ne m'occupais pas de politique à ce moment-là, je le dis franchement. J'étais bien trop petite, j'étais bien trop jeune, j'allais à l'école avec mes petites soquettes blanches. To ingratiate himself with the Nazis even more, de Grel didn't just adopt their external trappings, he adopted their rhetoric too. Jews, liberals, Freemasons, and especially communists, all became targets. And in 1941, he went a step further. He categorically supported Nazi rule in writing signing off an article with the words, Heil Hitler. De Grel's desire for power had put him on the path of unlimited collaboration. But even now, he still wasn't taken seriously in Berlin. Goebbels described him as a fraud. It seemed that Leon de Grel was destined to be nothing more than the leader of a marginal party of unpopular extremists. But again, rather than accept Hitler's rejection, he resolved to find a new way to ingratiate himself with the Führer. And soon the German leader's ideological crusade would give him the perfect launch pad. June 1941. Hitler's armies launched Operation Barbarossa, the massive invasion of Russia along a 2,000-mile front. Hitler had vowed to crush the communist threat. Now, it was a reality. All over Europe, collaborationist regimes were providing volunteers to join the Führer's crusade. Il n'y a jamais eu un engouement aussi grand dans tous les pays d'Europe pour aller combattre le communisme. Il y a eu des volontaires dans tous les pays d'Europe. Denmark, Norway and Finland had all supplied soldiers for special SS units, dubbed Freiwilligen or volunteers. In Belgium, De Grel's great political rivals, the VNV, had been allowed to form a legion in June 1941. Known as the Flemish Lions, they were considered an elite SS unit. De Grel realized this was a new opportunity. He too would join Hitler's crusade and become the best soldier he ever had and his finest leader of men. De Grel's plan was to be so successful in battle that he could return to Belgium at the head of a conquering army. Then at last, he would have political credibility and ultimately, power. But there was a snag. De Grel had no military experience at all. So what he did next was truly astonishing. De Grel handed the leadership of his party to a deputy, 
Victor Matisse. And enrolled as an ordinary foot soldier in the Nazi battle against communism. In July 1941, de Grel joined the Légion Wallonie, a German army unit manned by French speaking Walloons. The wealthy and privileged young politician went off to war as a legionnaire machine gunner, a humble private along with 775 other foot soldiers and 16 officers. Whilst de Grel was motivated primarily by ambition, he was soon joined by other Walloons who felt ideologically compelled to combat communism. One man who followed de Grel into the Legion aged just 19 was Fernand Kaisergruber. His motives for fighting were crystal clear. Ideologique, la lutte anti-communiste. Et je pratique contre le bolchevisme. Fernand Kaisergruber never saw joining the Legion as an act of collaboration. Finalement, pour nous, c'était l'armée, c'était une armée européenne, puisque nous étions même, je crois, 37 pays. Donc, il n'y avait aucune raison de m'en faire ou de, de se faire du souci à ce sujet-là. Hein. Other recruits included Marie José de Goy's fiancé, Roger, whom she had met in the youth movement. Partir, un peu comme les croisés, pour défendre le, le, le tombeau de Jésus, eux partent pour défendre la Belgique et l'Europe. Je dis quand vous pensez qu'ils partent avec un idéal, qu'ils offrent leur vie pour défendre leur pays et l'Europe. Moi, j'avais 17 ans, j'ai trouvé ça formidable. That winter, de Grel and the Legionnaires got stuck into violent combat along the Russian front line. By January 1942, the Legion had lost half its men. In February, 200 Walloons were killed in one month alone, but de Grel survived. He was involved in more bitter fighting around the Mayas River in southern Russia. Outnumbered and cut off, the Legionnaires bravely blocked a huge Russian attack for 10 hours. This led to the unit's first battle honors. De Grel, along with other Walloons, was decorated. He was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class for bravery and was promoted to Sergeant Major. The Legion had acquired a reputation as determined fighters. And De Grel himself, the politician with no military training, was winning respect as a hardened warrior. He had no fear to expose his life. C'était pas un militaire de nature, mais il se pliait aux obligations requises d'un militaire. Ça, c'est un chose. Et il n'a pas, il n'a pas eu peur de une fois de emmener les hommes au front et de passer devant. Hein. Ça, ça s'est arrivé. Hein. In May 1942, he was made an officer. He also made the Legion his own. He removed any political rivals and ensured it was dominated by Rexists. He became its figurehead and was firmly in charge, even though he was only a lieutenant. De Grel was proud to lead his men, and his bravery was rewarded again. On May the 21st, he added the Iron Cross First Class to his tally. Three months later, he received the coveted infantry assault badge awarded only to those soldiers who had seen the whites of the enemy's eyes. 
He had cemented his position in the Legion and finally started to get noticed in Berlin. And de Grel now became the Legion's main recruiting force. His gamble to become a soldier was paying off. And soon events conspired to bring him even closer to the Nazis. February 1943, Stalingrad, a defeat of epic proportions for the Nazis. 400,000 German troops were lost or captured. It was a hammer blow to Hitler's campaign in the East and the first major disaster of the war. But instead of questioning his allegiance to Germany, Leon de Grel remained upbeat. He saw this news as a chance to get even closer to the Nazis. Now, he could get the attention of the Nazis he so craved. His currency, the lives of the men he could recruit to their cause. And so, on the back of his military record and the reputation of his Walloons, de Grel set out to win the blessing of that most Nazi of organizations, Adolf Hitler's SS. The SS was Hitler's elite personal army. They had their own uniforms, the best military equipment, and they fought unswervingly for the ideology of Nazism. Watching over it all was Heinrich Himmler, leader of the force of 900,000 men. He made sure that the Germanic ethnic purity of the SS was maintained. He also developed the SS racial vision of a world united along purely Aryan lines. To join the SS, de Grel would have to prove himself worthy and adopt their beliefs wholeheartedly. In May 1943, de Grel was granted an audience with Himmler. He listened to the SS Reichsführer's vision of a greater German empire, Germania, a racially pure superstate of Germanic peoples, and de Grel signed up for it. The fact that the Walloons spoke French and weren't Germanic hardly seemed to matter to either man. Instead, the former Belgian patriot agreed to carve up his country and cede Wallonia to the Reich. Belgium would be a thing of the past. It meant the death of his homeland and its subjugation to Hitler forever. At this point, de Grel betrayed everything he had previously stood for. He had crossed the line and become a fully-fledged Nazi. The SS Sturm Brigade Wallonie was duly formed in June 1943, numbering almost 2,000 men. For Fernand Kaisergruber, joining the SS did not bother him. De toute façon, j'ai pas de raison d'être honteux, hein? certainement pas. Je dis sincèrement, quand nous sommes passés à la SS, j'ai considéré comme le plus grand nombre d'entre nous que c'était, comment dirais-je, une promotion. Finally, all those years ingratiating himself with the Nazis had paid off. He now had that private army he had always wanted to lead. He had proven that he had leadership in his blood. And he had joined the ranks of the SS. But even that wasn't enough. He still hadn't received the adulation of the Führer himself. Soon, the perfect opportunity would present itself. Now, 
1943 was a year of more defeats for the German campaign in Russia. After the massive tank battle of Kursk, the Germans were on the retreat. Leon de Grel alternated between recruiting trips back to Belgium and frontline action with the Walloons. Il est monté en ligne souvent avec les hommes. Non, non, ça c'est. Ça il faut lui laisser et que personne ne vienne me dire le contraire. As the Russians drove the Nazis back, de Grel, along with his men and 60,000 Germans, became trapped in a salient known as the Kursen Pocket, near Cherkassy. They faced being cut off and annihilated by 300,000 Russians. It promised to be a fight without mercy. Cherkassy, ça c'était dur. Ouais, ouais. Ça, il a fallu voir. Dans la forêt d'Eclino, euh, en montant, il y avait à un moment donné trois ou quatre cadavres pendus, pendus dans des, dans des aux arbres, et il y avait un aumônier là-dedans. Et on leur avait coupé leur partie génitale et on l'a mis en bouche. Alors c'est dire qu'on savait bien qu'il ne fallait pas tomber vivant aux mains des Russes. Hein. De Grel and the Walloons were ordered to fight a desperate rearguard action to allow the 60,000 Germans to escape. There was a blessé Allemand that I saw move là, qui was encore, and a chat Russe that was crashed, he was Et je me souviendrai toujours, son bras était resté accroché dans sa manche à la chenille. Et cette chenille, chaque fois que la manche est bang contre bang pour la protection. Et quand le chat est passé dessus, sa tête devenait rouge, comme si le sang sortait de ses pores, comme ça. Despite being outnumbered six to one and taking massive casualties, the Walloons held back the Russian forces. Quand nous sommes montés à Tcherkassi, nous étions 2200 et nous sommes sortis à 632. 632 qui sont sortis vivants de là. The Walloons had saved the day, and the German units managed to escape. They had become heroes, and none more so than the wounded Leon de Grel, who had survived the retreat. After the battle, de Grel was whisked back to Berlin. There, the Führer was waiting. As the cameras rolled, he awarded de Grel the Knight's Cross, one of Germany's highest bravery awards. The former political write-off had become a super soldier. De Grel was held up as the epitome of the true-blooded collaborator, a resolute believer in the Nazi cause. He had become their poster child. More importantly, he had finally won the love of the Führer. De Grel declared that Hitler had told him, you are almost unique in history, a political leader who fights as a true soldier. If I had a son, I would wish him to be like you. Even Joseph Goebbels, who had once called de Grel a fraud, was quick to praise his men as heroes. De Grel was fated in Berlin and Paris, where he addressed a host of collaborators and sympathizers. He gave graphic accounts of the saving of the Kursen pocket. But his proudest moment was yet to come. He 
he and the Walloons were allowed to return here, to Brussels, for a lavish victory parade in their homeland. Leon de Grel at last returned to the scene of his past failures, a hero, as he had always intended, at the head of a victorious army. The crowds showed de Grel that he had finally secured some of the prestige and power that he had always craved. One eyewitness was Marie José de Goy. Voilà, moi j'ai été là, de ce côté-là, au Palais des Parfums. Là. Un monde fou. La bourse était remplie jusqu'à la gare du Nord et la gare du Midi. Les trottoirs débordaient. Un grand spectacle. Ça, c'est un grand moment de gloire pour lui. Hein? De voir tant de monde qui regarde les chars avec des légionnaires dedans. C'était pas des Allemands, hein? c'était de, tout des légionnaires. Quand un déferlement pareil peut sortir une révolution socialiste, mais mes chers. After the parade, he triumphantly addressed a mass rally in Brussels. But despite this personal success, the war was going badly. And in reality, his popularity at home was a mirage. Then came news of the inevitable. The United Nations have bridged the English Channel. On June the 6th, 1944, a date indelibly written in the annals of history by the armed forces of the free world, the fighting men of Britain, the Empire and America embarked on the greatest amphibious operation ever undertaken. The D-Day landings were a first step towards the liberation of occupied France and Belgium. Violence and retribution now erupted in Belgium at the prospect of liberation by the Allies. De Grel's Rexists, along with other collaborators like the Flemish VNV, were now in the crosshairs of the resistance. One after the other, collaborators were killed in targeted assassinations. It was a war civil war. Une foule déchaînée, il n'y a rien de plus grave. Elle perd toute la notion de justice, de bonté et de et de et d'objectivité. The scale of the violence within Belgium escalated ever more. It was now that de Grel's own family became a target. His brother, a pharmacist in his hometown of Bouillon, was shot by the resistance. The town's archivist, Roger Nicolas, has studied the events that followed. Donc le 8 juillet 1944, c'est dans le bâtiment qui se trouve derrière moi que le pharmacien Édouard de Grel, frère de Léon, a été abattu par la résistance régionale. Les deux résistants sont entrés dans la pharmacie, ont réclamé un médicament et ont abattu le pharmacien de Grel. Ensuite, les deux résistants ont emprunté la rue des Augustins, la rue du Bru, avant d'aller se cacher dans les bois proches de Bouillon. The German reaction was immediate. A curfew was imposed, and 46 people were arrested. Then, a Rexist hit squad from Brussels traveled to Bouillon and murdered another pharmacist in revenge. His name? was Henri Charles. Donc la plaque qui figure sur cette maison indique c'est le lieu où a été abattu le pharmacien Henri Charles le 9 juillet 1944 vers 11h du soir. De Grel returned to Belgium to attend his brother's funeral and called for revenge. Enraged, he called for bloody reprisals. In a telegram to Himmler, he demanded the execution of a hundred Belgians. Though the request was ignored, the former politician had shown himself to be as ruthless as any German Nazi. 
In the end, his hometown endured the brunt of his rage. Three hostages from Bouillon were chosen. Dans cet endroit précis de la forêt de Bouillon, les trois otages qui ont été pris le 11 juillet 1944 sont assassinés par probablement deux officiers allemands de la SD d'Arlon. Les pierres que nous pouvons voir ici, les trois pierres, indiquent l'endroit précis où les trois corps ont été retrouvés. The choice of those executed was especially resonant. It showed de Grel's fingerprints were all over the crime. On peut comprendre que c'est sur l'ordre personnel de Léon de Grel qui était présent à Bouillon le mardi 11 juillet. Et les trois otages dont on a retrouvé les corps ici étaient des adversaires particuliers de Léon de Grel, homme politique. There was now nothing left of the patriotic religious campaigner of his youth. As more blood was spilt by all sides, de Grel prepared to return to the Eastern Front. But even in these desperate times, he managed to recruit more Belgians to accompany him. It was testament to what a figure he had become, for some Belgians at least. With his new volunteers, de Grel fought in the defense of Estonia at the northernmost point of the Eastern Front. But it was a hopeless attempt to stop the advancing Russian juggernaut. He threw more and more Walloons into a succession of suicidal battles. Then bad news reached the front line. Early September 1944, Allied tanks drove into a liberated Brussels. Fini la commandantur, fini la verbe stelle de la porte de Namur, fini la Gestapo. In Belgium, any sympathizers or soldiers suspected of being Wallonian legionnaires were rounded up. On the Eastern Front, de Grel was now an Obersturmbannführer, in command of a whole division of volunteers. But they were now an exiled band of survivors, following a leader with no homeland. And anyway, the game was up. Defeat was inevitable. By the end of the war, only around 30 Wallonian remained. Of the 800 or so original legionnaires, de Grel was one of only a handful to survive the Russian front as a combatant. He had been wounded a total of seven times in four years of combat. But this wasn't the end for Leon de Grel. Far from it. It was time to devise another plan. In the end, it was typical de Grel. He requisitioned a Heinkel bomber and took off for Spain, the last friend of fascism in Europe. It was a nail-biting flight. The Heinkel had just enough fuel to reach the coast and had to crash land. De Grel was severely injured, but alive. The great survivor, had survived again. But while de Grel was untouchable under Spanish protection, other Rexists and Legion volunteers back in Belgium were less fortunate. J'ai trouvé ma page juste ridicule. On m'a condamné. J'étais un mois en prison. Ils ont dit on vous condamne à 15 ans, 15 ans de la perte de vos droits civils et politiques. J'avais 21 ans, sans doute à peu près, jusqu'à mes 36 ans. 
et 10 000 francs d'amende. 10 000 francs d'amende. Her husband, whom she had married in 1945 and who had survived the war, was arrested. Il a été condamné à mort comme officier de la Légion Wallonie. <laughs> tout, tout, euh, la, euh, les deux ans qu'il a été condamné à mort, je pouvais aller le voir tous les deux jours. Tous les deux jours. Dix minutes. Marie-Josée's husband was eventually released and they set about quietly rebuilding their lives. But unlike many of his followers or former comrades, de Grel was more vocal. Rather than renounce his past, he talked with pride of his time as a Nazi collaborator. He often wore his SS medals and uniform. He made numerous media appearances where he vehemently justified his choices. It was as if he were frozen in a past era. He continued to extol the racial theories and prejudices of the Nazis' ideology. In 1979, Pope John Paul II visited the site of the death camp at Auschwitz and de Grel rose to the occasion. He wrote an open letter to the Pope, denying the Holocaust. He dismissed the murder of six million Jews as a lie. De Grel stated, Zyklon B, which the Nazis used in the gas chambers, would have been impractical to use. As a result, he claimed it was logistically impossible to have killed the sheer numbers involved. He ended his letter proclaiming his faith as a fellow Catholic. But the truth was, Leon de Grel was more alienated than ever from his homeland and his origins as a Catholic campaigner. He had been sentenced to death in Belgium and several attempts to extradite him had failed. In the end, Leon de Grel died aged 87 in 1994 in Malaga, Spain. Today, his legacy still divides Belgium. Those who survive him can only reflect on his impact on their lives and on those Walloons who fought and died at his side. Remarquable et admirable. Moi, on va dire que je suis folle parce que je dis admirable, mais pour moi, c'était oui. Ils offraient leur vie d'avance. Et je vous assure, ça m'émeut toujours. Ça m'émeut toujours. Parce que je vois leur visage, je connais leur nom. Je ne les oublierai jamais, leur nom. Jamais. C'est gravé. Moi, je ne regrette pas de l'avoir vécu. Je regrette simplement la disparition de tous ses copains. Eh bien, on peut penser de Léon de Grel tout ce qu'on veut, on peut l'aimer ou le haïr. Je ne connais qu'un homme politique qui s'est engagé pour combattre lui-même sur le front. Je n'en connais aucun autre. De Grel went to his grave claiming that he fought as a brave Belgian nationalist. But the truth was that he fought for Germany to further his own ambition. He betrayed his country, and in the end, the course he chose culminated in murder, something that is still raw in Belgium today, especially in his hometown. Sa conduite en Russie au profit de l'armée allemande, les Bouillonnais n'en disaient rien, mais là où il a véritablement provoqué la haine de la presque totalité de la population, c'est quand il y a eu ces quatre assassinats et les otages. Tout ça pour venger la mort de son frère. The reality is, this former patriot was an adventurer who was prepared to gamble everything for his ambition, even if it meant sacrificing those around him and destroying his homeland forever. <laughs>